Hello everyone and welcome back for episode 19 of the Kairo Khan vs Everything Speedrun. We are currently around 1550 ELO, aiming for I'd say 2000 by the end of the series. This may take a while, it may not, depending on how well the Kairo Khan can serve us and how well I can serve the Kairo Khan. The basis of this series, for those of you that are new, is pretty simple. Whether we have the white or the black pieces, no matter what my opponent plays, I play a Kairo Khan-esque setup. And we see what we can do. And with that being said, let's get into the gameplay. Okay, we are facing... Let me make my first move. Obviously, C3 to mimic C6 of the Cairo Khan. Timur KTK. I have no idea what that flag is. I'm going to say Turkmenistan, I guess. Oh, it's Kazakhstan. I was on the right lines. Anyway, my opponent goes E5, which allows us to go for what is essentially a pure reverse Cairo Khan. Uh, because, of course, e4, c6, d4, d5 would be a normal Cairo Khan, and my opponent allows us to go into this. So I'm going to be trying to avoid London-type setups if possible. So I want my opponent to put a knight on f6 so that I can play bishop to g5, rather than having to go bishop to g4. Bishop e6 is not a good move. It's not a terrible move, right? But I don't think it's a good one. The reason being is that this bishop is just a big pawn. Like, if you just replaced the bishop with a pawn, not a whole lot would change. You'd lose control of these squares, but, like, that's not that important. The bishop is definitely a bit misplaced there, in my opinion. So I'm just going to develop normally. Maybe we can take advantage um, of the weakened b7 pawn, because obviously the bishop used to be defending that. We have a move like queen b3 in the future. But there is no rush at all, and with knight to f6, you guys know what I'm going to play now. Bishop g5. I don't want to put the bishop on f4, because whilst that might suit some people's play styles, you can argue that it contests a bishop going to d6, where it would be quite active. I prefer not to go into that kind of position. Personally, I don't like having my bishop on f4 or f5 in these caro type structures from either side. And my opponent goes knight c6. Again, I think this is a bit of an inaccuracy. So both bishop to e6 and knight c6, they're, in my opinion, suboptimal uh, squares for his pieces. The reason... So I explained the bishop, right? Uh, it just doesn't control many squares, right? The knight, the reason that's not great, yes, it targets some important squares in the center. However... How is black going to contest the dark squares in the center? He needs a pawn, because my pawn is doing a great job, right? Now, the problem is, he has no e-pawn. I did say that his bishop was basically a pawn, but it can't move like a pawn. It can't go to e5. His only other pawn is the c-pawn. He can't move that now, because his knight is in the way. So, by putting the knight on c6, the knight doesn't really do a whole lot in the center, because black has no pawns to put forward in front of the knight to support or for the knight to support a pawn break black can't do that now and so the knight is just a bit obsolete um in what it's doing currently he may try to reroute it to the light squares or something like that maybe he wants to put a bishop or a knight on b4 which makes the move a3 pretty tempting um if something like a3 knight a5 might try and get into like c4 I can probably just go e3 and give up my bishop for the knight to damage the structure and then get a massive center. Maybe I can put a knight on e5 to control that square. That would be a long-winded plan from my opponent anyway. Rook c1 is always a useful move because with the knight on c6 as well, the knight is kind of vulnerable, especially if I can get a bishop on b5 to apply more pressure. But also, because this pawn can't go to c6 or c5, if my rook goes to c1 and this knight ever moves, the c7 pawn could be quite vulnerable behind the knight. So that's also something to bear in mind. You could play knight to e5 in this position uh, because you'd be hoping for knight takes pawn takes and the knight can't move because of the pin. Although you might be able to play h6 there and get away with it. So yeah, it's knight e5 would be a hopeful move. And we're not here to play hopeful moves, we're here to play solid chess and play principled uh, ideas. That is my uh, playing style, after all. You could try and go e4 and take advantage of the fact that the knight is pinned, but that seems 
uh, way too early, especially with the weakness of this diagonal. This knight is trying to support the light squares, and if we push in the center, the bishop could cause us problems on b4. So a3 and e3 are the two moves that I want to play. e3 is obvious, getting the bishop out to complete my development. Probably put the bishop on d3 to look at this diagonal. Um, or to go a3 to stop a bishop from coming to b4. But if I go e3, bishop b4, and just go a3, surely he would have to take me. Because if he retreats and I go b4 and bishop b6, that bishop is just locked out of the game. And I can always put this pawn on b5 as well to kick this knight around. And besides, after a move like bishop b4, I could just play like rook c1 or queen b3, uh, putting pressure on the bishop, but also looking at that weak b7 pawn that I mentioned earlier. Your actions have consequences way down the line in a game of chess. So I'm going to go for e3. Was it necessary for me to have spent so long on that move? No, but it doesn't hurt. I've got a lot of time, um, he says, as he's probably going to lose on time. But yeah, here, obviously, I'm going to retreat. There's no need to take this without, like, a good reason, I don't think. Wow, okay. And my opponent goes all the way. Now, my bishop is quite good on this diagonal and can also access the e5 square, which is a lot stronger because g5 has been played because it means that this diagonal is weak. And it's not obvious where my opponent castles, because his kingside pawns are a mess now. And if he goes queenside, I've got the open c file, and I can throw these um, a and b pawns at him with tempo on his minor pieces. So this is looking like a very nice position so far. Queen b3 is tempting. Of course, you don't have to worry about this alignment with the bishop, really, because... Unless um, black can take on e4, which we don't really have to let him do, then we're fine. Uh, I don't want to put a knight on e5 because that allows black to trade off his bad knight. And then he can play a move like c6 to consolidate his queenside pawn structure. So I don't want to give him that out. Bishop d3 is certainly playable. Um, helped by the fact that I don't have to worry about a queen putting more pressure on the knight because the c pawn is on c7 again that's not really where the pawn belongs in these types of positions and that's another reason why i'm not going to do this because then he can play c6 bring his queen out and then he actually has pressure we don't want to allow that rook c1 is also a viable move but if we just go bishop d3 and prepare to castle then we will break the pin on the knight anyway and if he takes us unprompted like without us playing a move like a3 or queen b3 then we win a lot of time so I'm going to play bishop d3. This is a very active diagonal. This is a very nice diagonal. The only way for... Well, black can't challenge this one, right? I told you this bishop should have been on f5, not e6. Or, or the bishop could have been on g4. But then it could have gone like the long way around. But even then, because of the way that black has pushed his pawns up, that wouldn't really be viable. The only way it would be is with the pawns back on their starting squares. If this bishop was on g6 and I took to take with the h pawn, to keep the structure intact. That is generally how you do it. Sometimes you can take with the F pawn, but I'm going down a long tangent anyway. I hope I'm not losing any of you guys along the way. So I'm a big fan of this position. I'm just going to castle. Um, a move like G4, I don't care about. I can drop the knight back to D2. I can put the knight on E5. It doesn't really matter. Opponent put more pressure on the knight. He also threatens to take my bishop. And I did say that was an active bishop. But if he takes my bishop, I take back with the h-pawn. This is a reversal of what I was just talking about from the other side. And then my rook gets open on this very weak h6-pawn, which would be absolutely fantastic. And then I can probably just walk my king over to f1 or g1 to keep the rook active. So obviously my opponent is threatening to win the knight. So queen c2 or queen b3 look good. I think I prefer queen b3 because on c2... I can maybe get hit with a knight b4 in the future. Um, and I'd rather attack the bishop than the knight, because the knight is protected by a pawn. I don't want to take this, because all it does is activate his pieces. And my knight has to move. He can trade off his bad knight. And black is well and truly back in the game. So I'm going to go queen b3 instead. Um, I think that's a very logical move. I know I'm not threatening to win the bishop. But 
I'm just defending the knight. Rook c1 is potentially my next move. A3 would be good as well. Because if the bishop moves, then b7 is now exposed. I probably wouldn't take it because I'd have too many problems with the knight, I think. But it, it is a potential option, especially if I can take this knight with check up in some way. Yeah, that would actually work, thinking about it. Because if, um, let's say it's my move, a3, bishop a5, queen b7, knight c6, I can play queen c6 check first. If bishop d7, I don't know though. Yeah, bishop c3 is not a good move. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. We take with the pawn, of course, don't want to lose the queen. And now he's just uncovered the b7 pawn for us. He, one of his two most active pieces, the knight and the bishop, has now been traded off. But, I mean, my pretty inactive piece. It was one of my worst pieces, to be honest. And we also open up the B file to put our rook on if we want. The fact that the pawn is now on C3 rather than B2 means that C4 is a potential pawn break in the future. Right now, I don't think it'd be very good. Okay, B6 is played. This, I think, further weakens the C7 pawn because if it ever makes it to C6, it's no longer defended. And it also weakens the light squares generally around the black queen side. Whether we can take advantage of them immediately or not, I don't know. But it definitely gives us options in the future. There's also ideas of like takes, takes, d5 with a fork, but it doesn't work right now. Just good to have in the back of your mind. We have a good position. But I'm not sure how to continue. Castling is the obvious move. But then after takes takes, my rook isn't in the, on the open file. But then I can play, I can build up through a move like e4 or maybe even f4. c4. I don't really want to do this because the knight can just stop me. I could play a move like bishop b5. Which actually looks pretty good. Because if queen d7 defending, then it's just another pin. Like, I'm pinning to the queen rather than the king. Um, and if bishop to d7, then you just hang the d5 pawn because you lose a defender and you cut off the queen's defense. So I think bishop to b5 is actually a really difficult move for black to meet. Because how do you defend yourself? I think queen d7 is the only viable option. But then I can just play knight e5, and black is in a lot of trouble. I think this might be a fairly quick win, um, simply because black has created too many holes in his position. Yeah, there we go. He plays it. Um, I don't think there's any tricks. After knight e5, if takes, we take here. And I mean, black gets two pieces for a queen, but it's not enough. Uh, especially because the rooks are so inactive. There's, I don't think there's any tricks of like knight d4 trying to win my queen because I always take his queen with check. So yeah, I think this is a pretty easy move to play. And it just highlights the, um, the fact that you cannot create so many weaknesses in your position. And it all started because he put his bishop on e6. It was a, not an optimal square for the bishop to be on. It weakened the queen side because the queen side was weakened. Well, be even before that, um, the knight came to c6, which meant that the c pawn was stuck in place. And I said the knight could become a vulnerable piece because b7 was weak because the bishop moved out probably too early. You normally develop knights before bishops. This is one of the reasons why. It meant that my opponent had a very um fragile plan to protect his b7 pawn to protect his light squares right um and then we just take over the light squares because he puts all his pawns on dark squares which meant that this knight on c6 was even weaker and now we win a queen because of it of course we take the queen now he takes back with the knight so he gets two pieces for a knight sorry two pieces for a queen but this is still completely winning i think f3 is a nice move here because this is my opponent's best piece. Of course, f3, you would normally say, is weakening. But he has no queen to attack me. He also has no dark squared bishop to attack me. So if he takes takes, it just activates my rook. If he retreats, then his knight just isn't that good. 
we could have taken on C7. Uh, absolutely. But, I don't know. I'm not that bothered about a pawn right now. I'd rather get my king incredibly safe on F2, connect my rooks, open the H file, prepare for pawn breaks like E4, maybe F4, maybe C4, maybe A4, A5, now that the knight isn't on the queen side. And I think A4, A5 looks very tempting if A4, my opponent plays A5. Hmm, that's not terrible. And we don't get an immediate attack, but it does lock down the queen side a bit. Yeah, go on, let's just do it. Let's not think too hard. I mean, he has to play that. No, he doesn't. Wow. No, he can't get away with that. I'm just going to ignore him. If he goes c4, I don't care. I move my queen somewhere. If he takes, then all it's going to do is open up the c file against him. I could even just take on b6 if I wanted to, but I don't think there's any need. I can leave the tension there a little bit because if he moves the pawn, he just gets taken. So... If he takes me, my rook gets involved and causes a lot of chaos. So, yeah, I think a lesson in weak squares, um, weak color complex, weak queenside in general. And my opponent, like, made it so that he couldn't even castle kingside to get out of the problems he faced on the queenside because he just launched those pawns forward so willingly. Of course, these are all, like, tiny, tiny mistakes, right? They're not, like massive game ending blunders a move like b6 and queen d7 in tandem are a big blunder because it loses a queen for two minor pieces or you just lose like a piece and an exchange if you move the queen after knight e5 but it's like the culmination of tiny little mistakes just lead to massive positional weaknesses and that's really the difference between you know i'm rated around 2000 normally I think that's kind of the difference between a 2000 and a 1500 rated player is that I don't make quite so many of those of those small inaccuracies and small mistakes that culminate and I can recognize when my opponent is making more of them. Let me know if you agree with that. Of course, I'm going to take because he now just relinquished a defender of the pawn. We're going to rip open his king's position. Uh, probably move our king, get our rook involved. We could play rook to a8. It's game over, really. Um, okay, he's going to run away with his king. Makes sense, let's give a check. I suppose the game isn't totally over, but it basically is. Um, queen c7 threatens mate. And if you play rook d7, I win the knight. If queen c7, knight d7... I guess he kills up and protects himself for now. Maybe castling is just the easiest thing to do. To get my other rook on c7. That looks pretty good to me. King f2 is also playable, but I don't really care about the h file anymore. I could try and stop his king from running away with a move like queen b4. But then um, with the idea of controlling the diagonal. But then knight c6 is a bit of an issue. Uh, well, I can probably get out of it with a move like queen a4 pinning the knight, but I'd rather not have to deal with that. I think castling is a lot easier. We're up, you know, two pieces and, like, a pawn. Okay, yeah, knight d7 anyway. Uh, it's not obvious where I want to put my queen. My opponent is curling up quite well. And just protecting himself. F4 might be an idea soon. I might put the uh, queen on b4 now though. Because previously I didn't want to allow knight c6. But now he can't play it. And I continue and now I'm trying to stop his king from escaping. Rook b8 is the move that I expect my opponent to play. I can't try some fancy tactics like this. Because if rook b8, rook d7. My opponent just takes my queen. And um, I lose. Whoa, f5. Maybe he's trying to use this square? Wow, that is bold. Okay. e4 is screaming to me to be played now. It's like in forcibly open lines. I think I have to play it. And weakening the dart squares isn't a big deal because my opponent has no dart squared bishop. 
Uh, he has a light squared bishop. And my king is not on a light square. He can always go to h2 as well if he needs to. So yeah, I think ripping open the center now is the best way to go. f4 might be a good idea. I think I probably take on d5 to open up the e file in that scenario. And my rook and queen could potentially link up on e7. Okay. Let's take. Keep things nice and easy. Just open up the e file. Um, yeah, I think rook e1 is good. Because my opponent, I think, has to play one of his rooks to e8. Otherwise, I invade on e7. And I don't know how he survives that. So I think we're going to force him to make a trade now. Yeah, we don't actually have to take him because our queen could take on e1. But I think we should take. And then I think I want to put my king on f2. <laughs> yeah, I think king f2 here is quite nice. Although there's also queen b5 attacking the knight and attacking the d5 pawn. I don't know how you defend both at once. You could go king e6. Oh no, but then your bishop's cut off from defending the knight. So queen b5 is probably just a simple fork. And the knight can't move to defend the pawn because the knight is pinned. We also have eyes on the rook. I don't think that really matters, but worth noting. Um, There's no worries on the back rank or anything. We just move our king to f2. Our queen usefully controls this diagonal, which means the bishop can't get involved. Because there are some potential mating patterns or some perpetual stuff. But I always have the h2 square anyway, so I'm absolutely fine. Um, this cluster of pawns is quite nice around my king. And my opponent has just pushed all of his pawns out, so his king will never find shelter. Um, and I think we should just be able to... If we, if we win the uh, d5 pawn, then his position should fall apart, because our rook is very strong, and our queen will be able to get into, like the real fruits of my opponent's position and just take everything really so yeah this i think again like i said before okay obviously i'm going to take the knight this game really does highlight the difference in skill and that is not like shade to my opponent in any way uh, by the way i'm giving this check rather than taking the pawn because i want to try and take the pawn with check um but yeah, my opponent resigns. And it's just, just a very solid game. Like, again, I think similar to the pr my previous video in the Karo Khan. Probably going to be quite a high accuracy. Also helped by the fact that it wasn't a particularly long game. Because humans make way more mistakes in end games that bring the uh, accuracy down. This game was just a lot of little mistakes. And I'll run you through, quickly, just without the computer analysis, what I think these little mistakes were. Bishop e6 is number one. Knight f6 is fine. Knight c6 is number two. Just misplaced minor pieces. h6 is fine. g5. Ooh. g5 is the third little mistake. So we've got three little mistakes now, right? That culminates a bit. Um, the computer says I'm at plus 0.6 now. Not a winning advantage, but you're getting there. Bring the bishop back. Bishop b4 is fine. Knight e4 is fine as well. Taking is another small inaccuracy. The computer, you can't see the analysis bar, but it just jumps up like 0.1, just a little bit more. Just all these tiny little mistakes, adding just a tiny bit of evaluation each time. B6 puts it again just a bit more, a bit more of a mistake. Bishop B5, Queen D7 is the wrong move. I think Bishop D7 had to be played. Computer agrees, you have to give up the pawn, which would actually be a mistake. Oh, because you take on C, you take on C three. Oh, that isn't actually the best move then. If here, here, yeah, I actually don't know what White does here. So you just have to come back and do this. White is still better, but not as much. With all the dark square, with all the light squared holes, you want your light squared bishop. But anyway, Queen D seven is not the way to go. Here it's pretty cut and dry. Um, yeah, c5 was definitely the wrong move. You have to play a5 to stop me from doing it. 
And um, yeah, then the position just falls apart, really. King gets hunted down. Open up some more lines, trade some pieces, win some more material, and my opponent resigns because my queen is going to sweep up. We'll see what the computer has to say about this. I would encourage you to stick around for a short analysis at the end of this video. It'll be like 5-10 minutes. Hope you guys enjoyed, and let's get into it. So as you guys may already know from the title or thumbnail of this video, very high accuracy again in this game. This is a running theme in these Karo Khan positions. I think as like a culmination of the rapid rating climb with the Karo Khan being played a lot and the Karo Khan speed run, the Karo Khan versus everything speed run, I think I'm really developing like a feel for Karo Khan positions and the sort of ways that I should be playing in them, which is leading to these very, very consistently high accuracy games beyond like what my actual rating should really be about. Um, like at a 2000 rating, I would expect my games to be about 80-ish percent, but this is a 92.5, which is pretty normal at this point, actually. Um, Kramnik, please don't notice me. Um, but yeah, okay. Let's see what the computer has to say. Obviously, we know this is just a reverse... Um, Karo Khan, if you whack a pawn on d4 or like a knight on c3 or a knight on f3, uh, well, other way around, c6, f6, d5, um, it's just a normal Karo Khan, except white is obviously half a move ahead. Takes, takes, d5, knight c3, this is all fine. Like I was saying, the knight doesn't go on c6, the computer's favorite moves, bishop f5, knight f6, and c6. And c6 just like mimics a sort of exchange slav. Um, no, it would be a Queen's Gambit declined position. I think we transposed to this in a previous episode where we would get exactly the same position um, from a reverse, not a reverse, from just a Queen's Gambit decline exchange. It'd be the same because if you take this position and this position, they're exactly the same, just different move orders. I don't know the theory of the Queen's Gambit declined, but it clearly functions in a similar way to the Karo Khan. So maybe I'll play it with white as a bit of a surprise weapon. That might be a good thing to do, actually. Especially for anyone else playing the Karo Khan. That might be a good idea. Anyway. D5, knight c3, bishop e6. Black's first, like, inaccuracy. We keep developing. Bishop g5. The computer doesn't love it. Prefers, bish there. Prefers queen b3 immediately to go after the weakness. And b6 would be bad here again, it's just weakening. Knight g5 also existed in positions to chase the bishop, worth noting. Um, but queen c8 is the engine's favourite move, just defending the pawn. And black will continue developing with moves like c6, knight d7, bishop d6 castles. Or at least that's how I would do it. Bishop g5, knight c6, again, another inaccuracy. e3, we just continue developing h6 we retreat the bishop computer doesn't mind taking but i didn't see the need to uh you can take if you want though g5 bishop g3 bishop b4 bishop d3 again we didn't have to react immediately and i'm happy that i didn't knight e4 puts pressure on the knight the computer actually just wants to give the pawn up and if something like this rook b1 and black has a whole lot of problems coming his way so I definitely could have gone for this if I had considered it. I went queen b3. Still a fine move. Taking is not the way to go. Like, black doesn't have to react here because the knight is defending the bishop. But the problem is, the moves the computer suggests, right? Are h5, which is just a weird move to play. It makes sense once you see it. Because the point is you threaten to go after the bishop. If the bishop ends up going to e5, he can be taken by the knight. And if a move like h3 is played to give the bishop an escape square, that's bad because you ruin your structure. Because what white wants is this to open the rook up, not to have to take with the f-pawn and break up his structure, right? But, okay, like, you know, the best moves are h5, which is just a bit weird, a6, which, I mean, it makes sense, but it's a bit weird, and castles, which looks insane, so... You know, it's it's a tough position for Black to try and maneuver now. He goes with Bishop takes C3, which is not the right way to go. Bc3, we attack the B7 pawn. B6 is not the way to go. 
Rook b8 is a better way to defend. Knight a5 is playable, but in my opinion, risky. You don't um, suffer a fork here because of the move c6. The queen defends the knight. The pawn attacks the queen. The knight defends b7, and the pawn blocks the queen's attack on the king. This is a very common pattern. You should learn it. b6 is played. Just opens up a lot of light squared weaknesses. We go bishop b5, which is by far the best move in the position and the only winning move because this is just a massive issue. And yeah, bishop d7 is the best move. Taking is not good because of knight c3. We have to move the queen and black is okay. The way to handle this position is knight e5. And if takes, bishop e5 attacks the rook. Let's say castles. And then you win the d5 pawn. You get rid of the knight first. You forcefully trade the knight. Wait, no, you can do this though. What am I on? Oh, then d7. The difference is this knight is out of the way and then the bishop defends... Sorry, attacks the d7 square. Don't listen to me. I'm a measly 2000. Anyway, queen d7 is played and that clearly blunders um, a simple fork. My opponent goes for the most pragmatic option. I would have absolutely done the same with my opponent here. It's no good moving your queen and just losing like even more stuff. That is not the way to go. Better to get two pieces for the queen and see if you can do anything. Um, I go f3 here. Not the most accurate move necessarily, but just a good move. Black either retreats his knight to a passive square or he trades with me, which I want. Castle queen side is apparently the best move, which is mental in my opinion. A4, A5, or A6. If A6, A5, B5, one of these needs to be played. My opponent does neither. He actually just opens himself up more. And normally, this kind of move in this sort of structure would be good. Supported by the knight, supported by the pawn, trying to attack white center. That would normally be the way to go. But not when you're down a queen and your king is castled right behind those pawns you're pushing. Generally, yes, good idea. Not here. I go a5, no need to take and give my opponent the sort of thing that he wants. This is still fine for white, but don't allow anything. cd4, cd4, knight b8, I don't really understand. We win another pawn. Check, king e8, castle, knight d7, these are all just good moves. Queen d6 was better than queen b4, accomplished the same goal, but on d6 we're just more inside my opponent's territory. I didn't want to allow any kind of discovery on my queen, although I guess geometrically I control the majority of the squares this knight can go to. And we're also threatening queen e7 if um, the knight moves, but queen b4 is fine. f5 is a weird move. We go e4 trying to open things up. If my opponent were to take, I'm just going to take, open up the f file and try and make stuff happen. King f7, e f5, bishop. Did I say bishop? Bishop? I think I turned Russian for a second there. Anyway, I, t I told you I'd make this analysis quick, right? <laughs> Rook h8 has to be played because if you do not contest the e-file, you're going to die. Bishop b6 is the only other way to block it off, really. Which I guess is playable, but I assume I just play f4. The computer might not think it's the best move, but this would be my way of trying to break into the position and just open more stuff up, try and force the bishop to vacate uh, bl the blockage of the e-file, and potentially just forcefully win some pawns or force some exchanges. We exchange, queen b5, simple double attack, like I said, rook e7 is the best move, which is what I was expecting, and I win the pawn, get a passer, attack the bishop, attack the knight, this is all very good stuff. My opponent goes bishop e6 instead, allowing us to win two minor pieces for a rook and now we're just down to a queen versus rook and i mean there is no kind of fortress going on here um, i have way too many pawns for that and this king is way too weak for that my opponent resigns there's, there's nothing really more to be done in this position but yeah basically just like three or four small mistakes that culminated in a big problem for my opponent we capitalized on it and we again show the power of the karo khan if you guys want to check out the previous episodes of this playlist of the Karo Khan vs. Everything series, or just any of the Karo Khan games on my channel, playlists will be linked below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.